This video shows you how to start up the Nikon A1R confocal microscope at the Centre for Life and add a sample to an air or oil immersion objective. On the left of the microscope, switch on the scan head using the button on the left of the electronics stack and turn the key on the laser bed to power up the lasers. Above the microscope on the left, switch on the Z drive, the stage controller and the halogen lamp for transmitted light. On the same shelf, switch on the power for the camera if you're using the system in wide field mode. To the right of this are the controller units for running the incubator. We won't be using these. Next, power on the microscope body, which is a switch situated right at the back on the right of the microscope, just below the epifluorescence launch tube. Whilst the microscope is booting, switch on the PC, which is located to the right of the microscope table, using the power button on the top left of the front panel. Whilst the PC boots, swing the monitor around to access the surge protected plug bank behind it. Plug in the plug labelled compressor. Swing the monitor back round and lastly switch on the wall plug labelled LEDs for the epifluorescence lamp. To add your sample to the stage, check which objective is in position on the front LCD screen. Here it confirms we are on an air objective. Open the incubator and bring your sample in through one of the access doors. Tilt the condenser arm back and place your sample in the stage holder. Cover slip down and flat. Use the joystick to manoeuvre the stage so that your sample is above the objective and bring the condenser arm forward once more. To find our sample using Brightfield, on the left of the microscope body there is a transmitted lamp on off button and on the right there are two buttons labelled escape and refocus. Firstly, Press escape to bring the objective to a known position. And then once it has finished moving, press refocus to move the objective back to approximately the focal plane. Now open the transmitted lamp shutter. We're using the button on the left and using the focus knob and joystick, find your sample and focal plane. Once found, switch the lamp off with the same button. If you want to locate your sample using fluorescence, use the filter select buttons on the right to rotate the filter wheel to a suitable cube, such as Fitzy, as shown on the LCD screen. For excitation, use a QLED control to switch on the correct wavelength of light, choosing UV, blue or green. Here we're using the Fitzy cube, so require blue excitation light. Ensure it is selected and press on to switch the LED on. If you're unsure, you can use all three. The excitation filter in the selected cube will block the other wavelengths. Fine tune your focus and position, and once satisfied, switch the fluorescence lamp off to preserve your sample. If you wish to use an oil immersion lens, firstly check that the current position means the lens isn't close to the edge of the sample holder, otherwise the oil immersion lens won't be able to reach the focal plane. Do this by tilting the condenser arm back and checking the current position. Now use the objective turret control on the left of the microscope to move to your desired oil immersion lens as shown on the LCD screen. Next add oil onto your cover slip. Remove the sample and using the applicator attached to the lid of the oil bottle, collect a small drop of oil on the end and carefully apply a drop to your cover slip. Bring your sample to the stage and insert your sample into the stage holder, cover slip downwards. Bring the condenser arm forward again and find your sample as just described for the air objectives. Once you have the microscope all switched on, log into the computer, register with PPMS and then start the NIST Elements program. Put your username and password in the required windows. If there is an option, select Nikon A1R Confocal from the drop-down menu and the microscope will initialize. 
wait until the software opens up. Note that the previous user's Confocus settings may be preserved. If the layout looks unfamiliar, many of the menus can be accessed by right-clicking on the background, and that will open up acquisition windows. If you are unsure how to do these and how to reach all these windows, please ask a member of staff. The Nikon Elements graphical user interface appears to be much more intimidating than it really is. There are many buttons that can be pushed and many options that can be selected, but most users will interact with this subset of these possibilities, and it can be broken down to these main windows. On the right side are the image viewing panel, where the acquired images will be shown on the right side just below the Nikon icon. The most important, one of the most important windows is the TI pad, which is an, an interactive panel that allows for the direct control of the microscope. In general, the only proportion of this window that you will be using regularly are the objectives. Here are all the available lenses, um, which are highlighted and indicating magnification. And if you hover over them with the mouse, you get a lot more information about the objectives such as numerical aperture, working distance, and more importantly, immersion type. Below the objectives, uh, you can select the light path, where you can choose to either see the samples through the ocular or through the NIST element software. And in here, you can also set the perfect focus system. Underneath the PFS, you find the um, lamps, the dial lamps, this sidebar controls the halogen lamp, allowing you to find the samples with your eyes. Below this section, you can choose the filter cubes. In this system, there are red, green and blue filter cube installed for visualizing the samples. And a zoom underneath. The next important panel is the QC panel that, that contains the predefined configuration for both laser scanning, confocal and wide field, um, wide field mode. These presets can be modified to fit your imaging uh, needs. The A1 Plus compact, compact GUI within this panel uh, you find all the necessary controls for uh, laser scanning confocal, such as lasers to use, laser powers, and also set the offset and the uh, PMT gain for each selected channels. Another window which is important uh, is, is the ND acquisition. This panel is used to um, perform multi-dimensional acquisitions, including time-lapse, z-stack, multi-points, or large images, also, also known as tiled images. But also important is the histogram. So I'm just gonna open up the histogram window here. Both the histogram and uh, lookup tables um, are important. These give you numerical information regarding the distribution uh, of pixel in intensities across your live and acquired images. And you can also adjust the brightness and contrast of your image to highlight specific features. And that can be done either manually or automatically. And finally, the last window, which, uh, which is very important, is the A1 plus scan area located below the A1 compact GUI. And here you can control the size of your scan area and the step size of the galvanometer, also uh, known as pixel size. To find your sample, first select the appropriate objective. All available lenses are visible in the TI pad panel and click on the one you wish to use. The microscope will automatically rotate the objective turret into position. Add immersion oil if necessary. Please do not put oil on an air objective. Regarding oil, 
do not put too much onto the objective. A small drop is sufficient. If too much oil is used, it can enter into the objective and render it useless. Once the immersion oil is placed, place your sample in a stage. First, open the door to the incubator by the rotating handle. Move the condenser backwards to allow better access. Place your sample in a slide holder cover sleeves down. Bring the condenser arm forward. And use the stage controller to move your sample above the objective. Click the refocus button on the right side of the body to bring the sample to approximate focus. Be careful not to touch the objective to the cover slip or sample stage if an oil immersion objective is used. Raise the objective until you observe the oil touching the cover slip. At this point, you are close to the focal plane. To observe the fluorescence with your eyes through the oculars, you must put the A1R system into a wide field configuration. This is done by selecting an eye port or clicking on an E100, meaning 100% of the light will be directed to ocular. Select the filter you require by using the filter menu on a TiPad window. This will default to the last filter used. To be able to visualize the sample through the ocular, open up the light shutter as required. To avoid sample bleaching, it is recommended that the shutter be closed when not observing the sample. Always close the shutter when switching to confocal settings. Use the joystick to find an area of interest and focus. Your sample may be found by adjusting the Z position. Once the appropriate focal plane been found, verify all of your fluorophores that should be present. When the sample is observed and found, close the shutter. It is necessary to re-enter the confocal mode in order to observe your samples through Nikon elements. First deselect iPort and then select the channels you wish to use. Automatically you find the channels which are used last in the lower part of the A1 compact GUI box. To reset the box uh, confocal settings appropriate for the sample in hand, press this button. A new window will op open here. Using the drop-down menus, select your dies. Channel 1 is usually the shorter wavelength and channel 4 is the longest wavelength dies. Select all the appropriate fluorophores that you used in your samples. It is also recommended to use the detector selection DU4 and the auto settings, which will input into the light path the correct dichroic mirror and emission filter for each respective die selected. The required lasers can also be selected up here and the transmitted light detector, which is down here below, can be moved into or out of the light path. The A1R system is equipped with two scanning methods, which can be selected in the A1 Compact GUI uh, box. One of them is the Galvano scanning. In this case, two galvanometer drives, drives scan mirrors and direct the laser beam to any XY position in the sample. This would allow a flexible frame scan and by increasing the pixel dwell time, it will reduce the scan speed and it, with it, it will increase the returned fluorescence. Of note, it's important to remember that the longer pixel dwell time will increase the chance of sample bleaching. The other option is the resonance scanning, which is recommended for imaging fast biological processes or those that are light sensitive. It has a lower scan size when compared to Galvano scanning. If you have not set up the scan settings, the scan will automatically default to the previous scan settings. The default setting is to scan usually all laser lines simultaneously. This reduces the scan time but increases the chance of channels bleeding through into each other. For this instance, you can see the DAPI, FIT and TRITI channel are scanned at the same time. 
Therefore, it is recommended to scan sequentially to reduce the chance of channels bleeding through. And that is achieved by a specific button, which is the channel series found in a A1 compact GUI. When channel series is selected, then the option to select each individual channel is enabled. You can choose which one you would like to scan first, and then you can modify the order for each channels. Start with your brightest fluorophore. Usually the 488 laser is the one uh, that is the brightest. Select it and then press scan on the top of the A1 compact GUI. As a good starting point, use the laser power between 1 and 5, though this is depends on the strength of your fluorophore. And the photomultiplier PMT gain, which is named as HV here, should be between 80 and 120. Above 120, you run the risk of amplifying noise and artifacts. In general, it is best to work with the higher gain and the lower laser power than the inverse. Once you selected the Fitzy channel, go to the next one and adjust all of them. When you are setting up the laser power and PMT gain for each individual channel, it is beneficial to identify whether you are over or underexposing your sample. For this, you can apply oversaturation colors to the live image using a drop-down menu in the loot window at the top right of the screen. Clicking on the arrow allows you to choose the color of for oversaturating pixels and for undersaturated pixels. Using this, you can change the laser power and the PMT gain to reduce the number of oversaturated pixels to a minimum and decrease the background so undersaturated pixels can be seen. At this point of time, I'm setting up the laser power and the gain for the fit channel. Oversaturated pixels are set to shown in red and undersaturated pixels are set to shown in blue, as you see in the background. So by reducing the laser power, I'll make sure that I reduce the number of the oversaturated pixels. If you see only a few red pixels, that is fine. I also go through the Z, uh, uh, Z stacks a little bit just to make sure that above or below the focal plane that I'm uh, looking at at this point of time, it doesn't have oversaturation. Once it's set, I switch to the next channel, which will be the DAPI. I unselect the Fitzy channel. And again, I'll make sure that the oversaturated pixels are shown, but first I'll find my sample by increasing the laser power. And again, here is the sample. I'll decrease the laser power so the background will be more obvious. Once this is set, I open up the window. Again, oversaturated pixels are shown in red, undersaturated pixels in blue, and there are still quite a few oversaturated pixels on the right uh, bottom corner. So I decrease the laser power, now this is good. And then finally, I move on to the third channel. find the sample by increasing the laser power. Remember this should be between 5 and 8 and the PMT gain should be between 80 and 120. So in this case the oversaturated pixels are shown in green. I'll make sure I reduce the number of the oversaturated pixels by decreasing the laser power. And then once I'm happy with this I'll make sure that all these uh, over and under saturated pixels will have no color association and then I'm ready to capture the images. Once you have selected all channels you wish to visualize, to stop the scan, simply press the scan button the second time. Press the capture button if a single acquisition is desired. This will generate an independent acquisition window. At this stage, you may want to activate averaging to increase the quality of your image by averaging out the noise. 
These captured images are shown on the right. You see all my channels, the DAPI, the FITI and the TRITI and the MERGE, and you can separate them or merge them together if you wish. Remember, captured images are not automatically saved. To save these images, you have to go to File, Save As, and Save As MD2 file into your individual folder on the desktop. These images can be opened with ImageJ and these elements. Single dimensional 2D images can be saved as TIFF files, but note it is not recommended to save files in JPEG form. As above, go to File, Save As, and you should be able to select TIFF as a file format to save. And now I'm going to introduce the ND Acquisition tab. This is also known as Multi Dimensional Acquisition tab. In here, you can set multiple predefined configuration for the Lambda for multi channel images. Z stacks, multi point, time series, large scans, uh, all of them are configured within this ND acquisition panel. You have to select the checkbox next to the corresponding multi dimensional acquisition that you would like to activate. So, first, I'll show you the lambda. Within the lambda tab, uh, which is uh, in, in the acquisition tab, it is possible to define and use multiple optical configurations. At least one optical configuration must be identified in the Lambda tab that is activated. So using this tab it will ensure that the multidimensional acquisition uses the channel settings that you already predefined. The path up here represents the location that your file will be saved to. This can be completed manually or by selecting the browse button on the right side. Once this information is entered, you need to press the Run button, which is found at the bottom right corner of the ND Acquisition panel to acquire the image. It is recommended that you complete the path and the file name for your acquisition, as under this mode, contrary using the single capture control, the image will not be automatically saved. It is possible to change the XY pixel size to improve image quality. The Nikon A1R uses a 512 pixel by 512 pixel image frame by default. While this is adequate for most users and applications, the image quality can appear to be lacking. To improve upon this, it is useful to increase your sampling rate or your XY step size. This can be increased in two ways. The first is to select the Nyquist XY in the A1 plus scan area. Pressing this button will tell the computer to calculate the optimal sampling step size in XY for the given objective. The Nyquist sampling rate allows for the optimal spatial resolution in XY for your sample to be achieved. As such, your sample will be properly sampled. Once the Nyquist XY button is selected, the scan area will decrease substantially as the pixel size is reduced. Alternatively, the scan area can be manually changed by modifying the zoom factor or by dragging the corner of the scan area. The pixel size will adjust automatically to the size of the modified scan area. The indicator box will become red and you will need to right click on the box to accept the modification. When this happens, it becomes green and all the change parameters can be seen below the scan area. Within the ND acquisition box, you are also able to do a Z stack. The Z stack takes advantage of the confocality of the A1R to acquire a 3D image of your sample, and there are multiple ways to define the parameter of the Z stack. You can set your Z stack by defining the top and bottom um, of your sample, or a symmetric Z stack, and a third option is the asymmetric Z-stack. Most users will want to define the top and bottom of their sample, so we will go through this configuration in more detail. Select the leftmost Z-stack icon, allowing you to define the top and bottom, and then select the appropriate Z-device. Deselect all of the different laser lines and channels within the A1 Plus Compact GUI, expect, except for one, it is recommended that you leave the channel of most importance or the one that you will most uh, that you think will help you most to define the top and bottom of your sample and then press a scan in the A1 plus compact GUI. Adjust the Z focus 
until the image is barely visible and mark this position by selecting top in a Z-Stack panel. If you are not sure which way you are going, up or down, you can look at the LCD panel on the microscope as the Z position is displayed. After selecting the top, move the Z wheel in the opposite direction, passing through your central focal plane, until the image again is barely visible. Mark this position by selecting bottom in the Z stack panel, and press scan to stop the lasers. At this point, you want to reactivate all the relevant laser lines that you would like to include in your multidimensional acquisition combined with Z-Stack. And then check the parameters of the Z-Stack before you start the experiment. The step shows you the size in micrometer that the Z-Device will move in between each acquisition. Steps, the number of total Z-Steps to be acquired. And in between the step, and steps field lies an active button with the Z distance. This is similar to the Nikon XY button found within the A1 plus scan area, but it applies to Z. Pressing this button will automatically adjust your step size and the number of steps necessary to complete the Z stack while ensuring the proper sampling frequency of your object. Press the Run Now button to start the Z stack, and a progress bar and an estimated acquisition time indicator should appear. For time-lapse imaging, it is usually of interest to follow multiple points, for example multiple cells, throughout the course of experiment. The Nikon Element software with the motorized XY stage allows you to save multiple regions of interest. This is done under the XY tab of the ND acquisition panel. This panel will show the physical location X and Y of each point. If I click in the first row, it will register the X and Y position of the current uh, location and you can select multiple positions. You can change the point name if you wish. This is particularly useful when imaging in multi-valve plates. You can go back to previous locations by pressing Move Stage to Selected Point, which is found just above the point names. And you can update the positional information by selecting an arrow marker that is enabled next to the XY. It is very important and worthwhile to remember that if the move stage to selected point is enabled, the microscope will automatically move to the selected point. This may be inconvenient, or in certain circumstances, it can cause damage to the objective if multiple points are selected that span multiple slides or multiple valves. Time-lapse imaging is extremely useful for the observation of cellular and subcellular kinetics. The parameters found within the time tab allow for significant control over the acquisition rate. The tab is broken down into four sections, phase, interval, duration and loops. Phase is the time sequence to be followed. Multiple phases can be established such that after one is completed the next and uses. This can be useful if the kinetics you are trying to observe change over time. Interval, the length of time of one image cycle. The duration is the total amount of time for the phase you can select which is best for your experiment and the loops is the number of intervals that will occur. Selecting the down arrow of the interval and duration field will allow you to change the units of the time. Further, you can select new delay, interval, and continuous in duration to acquire images as fast as possible until you tell the acquisition to end. Large image is a function that allows you to take a number of adjacent fields of view and display them next to each other or stitch them together. This is useful when you want to have a high resolution image but using a high power objective and still want to cover a wider field of view. To do this, the current field of view should be in the middle of the mosaic you want to make. Select the scan area and the number of columns and rows, for example the number of images across and down. Stitching is available and this is the process in which the program automatically overlaps and pieces your images together to give a final image. 
You can choose to select this process by selecting, selecting stitch or do not stitch. If you do not select stitching images, then these will be placed side by side in order of the capture. When you have set up the mosaic, ensure that the checkbox next to the large image and the lambda on a top row is ticked. This will activate the Run Now button and press Run Now to capture the image. Once you are happy with the images you have collected, save them as ND2 files in a folder you have created with your name on the D drive. This will not only save images, but all of the imaging conditions for laser power, gain, lens, scaling within the metadata, so you can reuse them when needed. You can also export images as JPEG or TIFF for presentation purposes, but always save the raw images first before using any image compression. When you are ready to finish your imaging session, close the NIST element software, log off the PC so the PPMS tracker is closed, and proceed to shut down to the microscope if you are the last user of the day. This video shows you how to shut down the Nikon A1R confocal microscope at the Centre for Life and clean an oil immersion objective. Once you have finished imaging your sample, tilt the condenser arm back and carefully remove your sample from the stage. If you used an oil immersion lens, take a single piece of lens tissue from the box and fold it in half. Use this to carefully wipe once across the objective lens to remove excess oil. Using a dry corner of the tissue, or a fresh clean one, wet it with ethanol from a supplied dropper bottle and once again wipe the objective lens to remove any residual oil. Finally, take a clean, dry piece of lens tissue, fold it in half and wipe the lens to remove any alcohol residue. Lastly, wipe any spillages from the microscope stage. Tilt the condenser arm forward again and press the escape button to move the objective down so that it is safe for the next user. Close the incubator doors and then begin powering off the machine. Switch off the wall plug labelled LEDs for the epifluorescence lamp. Swing the monitor around to access the surge protected plug bank behind it and unplug the plug that is labelled compressor. Swing the monitor back round and shut down the PC. Switch off the power for the camera if you used it and then switch off the microscope body. This is with the switch situated right at the back on the right of the microscope, just below the epifluorescence launch tube. Above the microscope on the left, switch off the stage controller and halogen lamp, and then the Z drive. Turn the key switch to power off the lasers, and then switch off the scan head using the button on the left of the electronic stack. The fan cooling the argon laser will continue to run. This turns itself off automatically after a few minutes.